Track and Field Black History, we are here with one of the legends in the sport of track and field, um, both as an athlete and, of course, as a coach now. Um, we're speaking with Dennis Mitchell. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so just tell us how you're feeling about Prefontaine Classic and your athletes coming up this weekend. Well, I feel really good about where we are in our training right now. I'm excited to get my athletes on the track to uh, compete tomorrow, and they're more than ready to run, and I'm happy for that. Uh, we're just going to go out there and mix it up and see what we can do. And like I said, so of course you were one of the greatest sprinters in the late 80s and the early 90s. Um, you had so much impact on the track in multiple ways, not only with your times, um, but also with kind of your personality. Um, so talk about why you kind of were pretty eccentric, right? You were pretty kind of, um, you're very enthusiastic um, and how that helped you in throughout your career and on the track. Well, I mean, me coming up as, as a young athlete, I came up in a time um, you know, in the late 80s, where there were a lot, a lot of great sprinters around at that time. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I was getting kind of left in the shuffle um, because I was out there winning races against some of these guys, but I wasn't getting the recognition for winning. So I kind of said to myself, I said, hey, if Dennis Mitchell isn't going to be important, then Dennis is going to create a new character. And I came up with a character called the Green Machine. And everything went up from there. Yeah, 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 nice. And do you have maybe one or it could be one or two impactful moments that you experienced throughout your career when you were running? Well, there was really never an impactful moment in my career that defined who I was as an athlete. I think my entire career kind of was that for me um, because I thoroughly enjoyed that journey, mm -hmm. you know. So I didn't really focus in on maybe one race or two races or medals or anything like that it was just the whole journey of my yeah. career that was important to me and and when i you know see people in the lobbies of hotels or i talk to them at track meets you know we all share different moments in that yeah, journey yeah, yeah. and that was fun that's fun for me yeah, there you go. um and so when you were competing um during that time what was the camaraderie like amongst you and uh, the other sprinters i know it was pretty intense yeah. for the most part but did you have like a good camaraderie kind of friendly rivalry or was it just intense all the time I was friends with 99% of the guys that I ran with. Uh, you know, the unique thing about what we did way back in the 80s and 90s were that we were very fierce competitors. Yeah. But what people didn't see is that we all hung out after the meet. You know, we all went to the clubs together. We all hung out. We all played, you know, there were no video games back then. So we played cards and, you know, and we all traveled together. So we were all in the same space a lot of the time. So we became friends. Uh, but when we were on the track, fierce competitors. <laughs> nice. um, and then the last two questions, who were some of your role models growing up as you were getting into the sport of track and field and also as you navigated through your career? Man, you know, I had one particular athlete that was my role model throughout the entirety of my career, and that's Muhammad Ali. I really loved him. I loved his, his, his style. I loved his athleticism. I loved his political stance. Yeah. I loved everything about him. And that's the person that I really, really connected to mm. as I was growing up and, and modeled myself after as an athlete. Beautiful. That is powerful. And then last question. So you did the sprints, right? You did the, the hundreds, you know, you dabbled in the, the 200 sometimes, right? And the four. A little bit, a little bit. Yeah, little yeah, bit. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little, I'm going to cut those out. Mm -hmm. If you can compete in any event, track or field but none of those no one two or four no 60 what would you do shot put <laughs> okay, <laughs> shot put? okay. Oh, man. that that event to me is is exciting it's mm. a very ballistic event yeah and it's just amazing how these guys can throw a, a, a put that dang on far mm. and i'd like to get out there and tussle with those guys a little bit <laughs> if i had a second event it would probably be high hurdles Nice, nice. Okay, wait. So with the shot put, I mean, the world record is almost, it's like 23 something. What yeah. do you what do you think you could have thrown? And so, I mean, that's, that's meters, but what do you think you could have thrown maybe? I'm going to say not that far. <laughs> 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 I wouldn't have thrown a world record, but I would love to have competed against those guys. There you go. I mean, you're I, mean I was a small guy, but if I had the size mm. and the power, it would have been shot put. There you go. Nice. Yeah. Well, Dennis Mitchell, really appreciate you joining us for today and sharing some of the, you know, your history and some of the things that you're doing, you've done and what you're doing now. And yeah, good luck with your athletes tomorrow. All right. Thanks, man. Thanks. Track and Field Black History. We are here with one of the legends in from the track and in coaching now, Eliane Francique. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And how are you feeling just about this weekend? You have a lot of athletes competing. 
Um, I feel good, good about this weekend, uh, especially with the, the pre fountain Classic. As a Nike athlete, I am around here plenty of times representing Nike. So now you have at least that running for Nike, you have to come back. So I do it both ways, coaching and competing. So it's, it's exciting. Nice. And yeah, of course you were, like you said, coaching and competing previously as one of the great 400 meter runners, um, you know, sprinters in the past. Do you have like a favorite race or favorite meet or favorite moment from your career on the track that, you know, is really impactful? Well, um, my favorite moment was in 2004 when I won the World Indoors. And it was the first for my country, my island of Grenada. So it was beautiful to parade the flag around the track and to hear our national anthem play. So that was a kind of proud moment for me. Nice. Yeah. That's beautiful. And like we were kind of talking about off camera, right? Grenada, there was you, and then Karani kind of replaced you in the, as a next generation, Rondell Bartholomew, right? But um, what, do you, what do you think of sprinting in Grenada and even just track and field in Grenada as the decades have gone on? But track and field in Grenada is a big, 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 especially in the high school level. And we have, we have a lot of talent, but we don't have the resources. And I think if we have the resources like the bigger, more developed countries, We'll have more athletes coming out, and it was fortunate. I was I was one of the fortunate ones to come out and um, got the opportunity. So I kind of explored, and then I kind of what you call it inspired other people like Kirani, Randell. So now we need another generation to come up. So we need people to kind of keep pushing the youths. But I think COVID kind of hit hit us back because we didn't have the high school meet for a couple of years. So I think a couple of the athletes got held back. So hopefully COVID gone away so we could kind of bring it back. Absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, yourself, you mentioned Karani James, right? Who were some of your role models when you were getting into track and field? Well, some of my role models, <laughs> well, it was in different sports. Yeah. Like I had, I like cricket. So yeah. it was Courtney Walsh. I like Michael Jordan. And on the track, I saw I was idolize Gregory Hatton from from yeah. um, from Jamaica. Yeah. I so I always wanna wanna be like him. You know, not always winning but I was being the final. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. Uh, you're throwing it back. I, lo I love that. I love that. And um what how is it like important? What do you see in terms of the importance of not only track and field but just sports in general for young athletes as they you know do grow older and become adults and navigate into the world? Well sports if, if you're in a good system it teach you discipline. It teach you how to how to go about life, teach you how, like when you get older, but you have to be disciplined with it though, and you have to be around the right people that instill the discipline in you. So, yeah. Nice. Love it, love it. Um, and so last question, you compete in the 400 meters, you know, you, you know, you dabbled in some other sprints as well, but if you can compete in any other event that was not your primary event, what would it be and why? Well, yeah, I competed in the 400, but I love the 800, and I think I was a better 800 runner than a 400 meter runner. But I really didn't want to do the training for the 800. <laughs> so I would, if I have to go back in time, I would, I would do the 800. <laughs> what, what do you think you could run? Or you could have run? Yeah, I probably could have run 142. Woo! Okay, 142. <laughs> Yeah. So you, you would have been right up there with David Rudisha, maybe pushing on him. Yeah, yeah, him big, on yeah. A lot of people don't know. I, I started running the eight, mm. but because of the training, I didn't want to do the training, <laughs> and I could run a good four. I, I just stuck with the four hundred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Real quick, can I ask you? Because um, a lot of four hundred meter runners, they do tend to drop down as opposed to go up. And I, I, but I think of you know you speaking about you starting the eight. I think um in the nineties there was Mark Everett who was like a good eight hundred runner, but he was good on the four hundred, right? Do you think four hundred runners should try and dabble up to the eight, or maybe it doesn't matter? But it, it, it depends yeah. because we have different type of 400 meter runners. You yeah. have the speed type and you have the strength type. Yeah. You have the speed type that could run one to four like Fred, and you have the strength type that could go for it. Yeah. Yeah. So it depends on on the athlete and and what they want to do. Nice, nice. Yeah. Alian Francique, we really appreciate you speaking. I, I think you should speak more. You are like you're dropping knowledge for us. So thank you so much for joining. All right. Thank you.
We are here with Track and Field Black History, and we are joined by one of the legends in track and field for various reasons, as um, of course now as a coach, um, but we'll hopefully talk about a little bit in terms of his competing before his uh, NFL career. But um, talking with Randall Cunningham, thank you so much for joining us today. And how are you feeling about uh, just this weekend with Vashti competing in the high jump? Oh, I feel really good. I think that uh, she's had about a week off, <laughs> not a whole lot, but she's excited. Uh, Nike built her a wardrobe, a brand new. I mean, when you see this wardrobe, it's really nice. So they're, they're using her not just as a high jump, but they're using her in the fashion world, which she loves fashion. Mm. So it allows her to feel good about herself and to know that, you know, someone cares about more than just her being a high jumper. Mm. And uh, it's really good. And I'm excited for her this weekend. Nice, nice. So can you talk about kind of your background? So you, you were just telling me you competed in the high jump in middle school, high school. Of course, you're known as, um, you know, a football player to the world. Um, but talk about kind of your upbringing and what got you into sports in general. Um, I was brought up in Santa Barbara, California. And, uh, you know, my parents worked. So I was at the boys club. I was at the beach. Uh, I was just getting involved in every kind of sport I could. And I just loved everything, whether it was uh, baseball, track and field, football, of course. I played a little bit of basketball. It wasn't really that good. But um, when, I, when I was in junior high, I started high jumping. And they put a pit out there, and I just ran and started jumping over it. And the next thing you know, I was winning. And in high school, I went like five feet six. I mean, not high school, junior high, I went five feet six. And, and I was the top jumper. So I said, I'll just keep doing it. So when I got to high school, it just turned into more. And then I was long jumping. I, I tried the hurdles, but I pole vaulted instead. And, uh, and I shot put it, believe it or not. And just really had a lot of fun. So track and field was like, it's always been my favorite sport because it's so diverse. Nice. Well, you're almost a decathlete a little bit, right? Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, and so during that time and even transitioning into college and eventually football, who were some of your role models that you looked up to, whether that be in sports or even just outside of sports? Uh, my role models uh, were simple. Was my, my brothers and then my brother Sam, he uh, played at USC. So we used to go down to the games at the, at the Trojan. And uh, then he played for the NFL in the Patriots. And so watched him and really it, it showed me that if he could make it, I could make it. And so he would encourage me. And one time he came to me and he said, he said, I asked him a question. I said, hey, do you think I could make it in the NFL? I was just in high school, my junior year. He says, yeah, your arm is as strong as the quarterbacks in the NFL now as a junior in high school. But you have to develop your leadership. So he, immediately I started working on leadership. So my brother Sam and guys like Doug Williams, you know, and uh, Vince Evans, African-American quarterbacks who, you know, I just really enjoyed watching because it gave me an opportunity to know I had a chance. Nice. And, you know, talking about you getting being self-taught in a high jump and then even talking about you developing your leadership when that's like one thing you had to do. Can you talk about some of the things that you instill in Vashti and then even just other young athletes um, in terms of some of the things that they want to achieve and some of the work it'll take to get there? Yeah, you know, I have uh, I have four children. <clears throat> Randall uh, the second, he was a high jumper at USC, yeah. uh, indoor and outdoor, all American and national champion. Um, Vashti, of course, is a professional. Uh, Gracie's at Texas Tech, mm -hmm. and Sophia's ten years old, so she's learning <laughs> after all of them. But the things that I instill in them is number one, God. You got to have God first because you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Mm -hmm. And then second of all, you got to respect people and you got to love people. And, uh, and when you have love and respect, uh, even though it's not reciprocated, uh, what can happen is, is you can be successful because people will view you in the right light. So I teach them morals and character and uh, just really just developing themselves through studying the Bible and the prayer life to God. And then um, thinking back to your career, um, both in middle school, high school, and then, of course, as you became a professional in, um, in football, do you have maybe a memorable moment, whether good or bad, but something that you can look back to and, you know, something that was really impactful? You know, I have a lot of memorable moments. <laughs> uh, the successes of, you know, winning, uh, finally winning a playoff game with the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, the being 13-0 in high school. <clears throat> uh, Winning the California Bowl at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, uh, being with the the Minnesota Vikings and scoring the most points offensively in the history of the league, and being around so many great players, and I realized, you know, you can't do things by yourself. You gotta you gotta have a team. You gotta have good coaching, good ownership, and 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 that's part of life, you know. And I think it's in every aspect of life. So when I reflect back on my my upbringing and my journey. Uh, I just see so many good things and I try to focus on the good. Nice. And do you think, because you're, you know, you spoke um, at the start about Vashti with Nike and some of the fashion things that she's getting into. Um, 
did you ever receive um, support from maybe role models or from others that you were growing up with in terms of preparing yourself after sports, right? And being ready for, you know, life as an adult after your, you know, your time in the sport, uh, sports realm is over. You know, it's funny you ask that because when I was playing with the Philadelphia Eagles, you know, I signed a contract for $810,000 for three years. That was very good back then. I was second round pick. But then I signed multiple contracts. And the second contract I signed, I went to the owner, Norman Brayman, great man of the Philadelphia Eagles. And I said, Mr. Brayman, I said, you're paying me all this money. What do I do with it? Mm. And he said, ah, just buy some certificates of deposit and just let them keep stacking up. And then later on in life, you'll look back and you're this multimillionaire. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's what I began to do. I just took that little bit of advice, and uh, it really has secured my kids. They're doing good. You know, they're able to purchase their own homes and things like that. They're able to respect um, making money, and uh, so I pretty much instilled that into all the people that I coach. And it's all the same values. Everything's the same. Nice. So, final question for you. So, you know, of course, you did track, and it, it seems like you did every event in track. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, you went into football. But if you can compete in any sport that's not track, not football, what sport would you do? Um, and track and field was making as much <laughs> as football and basketball <laughs> and baseball. Mm. There's no doubt I'd stay in track and field, individual sport. Uh, you really have to rely on yourself a lot as mm. long as you've got a good support team. But yeah, I would be in track and field. Yeah. Is there an event? And let's say like outside of the high jump, outside of the like, you know, some of the ones you did, is there an event that you would have wanted to do that you didn't get to? Yeah. Um, that I didn't get to do. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, was not a sprinter. <laughs> <laughs> Even though later on I developed speed, mm. uh, I always liked the field events. Yeah. And whether it was a shot put and uh, people would see the skinny guy in the in, <laughs> in the circle and they would be like hold on a second that guy and i would beat them because of my my torque of my arm is so long yeah, yeah yeah and i just loved it and they would be shocked that somebody so skinny could beat them and so <laughs> but it would be nice to be a shot putter but yeah. i probably would stick with the high jump oh man beautiful nice well thank you so much for speaking with us and good luck for um vash and i coming up on today yeah, so <laughs> absolutely we are here um now in eugene oregon at the prefontaine classic and we're speaking again with John Smith. I have the pleasure of speaking with him a couple weeks ago. Now we're here in person. Um, so John, thank you so much for joining us again today. You're welcome. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so first thing I want to start off with, and I forgot to actually mention, so I spoke with Steve Lewis um, about a week before I spoke to you online. Mm -hmm. And of course you have the 440-yard dash world record. He was mentioning that when him and Danny Everett, when they got to UCLA, they were like, we're gonna be nice and allow Coach John Smith to just keep keep his record because they could have probably broken the 440 yards, right? How would you feel about them as they came into UCLA as some of strong 400 meter runners? You know, I, I was uh, actually happy because you know I, I ran fast in '72, mm -hmm. and, and as a coach, you always want to have your, your 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 students to run faster than you. Um, I'm not that egotistical, um, thinking I'm going to carry it. You know, I had it once, um, and once is enough, <laughs> and I had my time in the, in, in the sun, and it's time for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And it would have given me great pleasure to have them to be recipients um, of, the, uh, of the record. If I didn't trip them before they got to the start of the finish line. <laughs> Absolutely. Nice. That, that's powerful. And then, of course, being here at Prefontaine, I mean, you go to so many different meets, but Eugene, Oregon, Prefontaine has, you know, such strong tradition and strong history in track and field. Um, what is it like coming back to Eugene? I mean, you broke your 440-yard world record, I think, in uh, in Oregon, right? In Eugene. In Eugene. Yeah. So right. what, what is it like just being here and seeing all the history as it's played out over decades? In our home. Yeah. You know, and back when I was in school, we had a lot of dual meets with uh, Washington, Washington State, Oregon, Oregon State, yeah. um, Cal, Stanford, and so we, we ran, um, we got a lot of our running and stuff through dual meets, mm -hmm. a lot of good competition. I, the best meet, the one was real rough, was the, uh, our 
our traditional SC UCLA meet, the rivals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that was off the chart. <laughs> <laughs> we at UCLA, we had 12,000 people watching us run. Wow. We who from uh, the um, from the movie industry would come out there. Yeah. Uh, it, it was it was nuts. Um, that's when track and field was at its heyday. Mm. My best friend, uh, Steve Prefontaine. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we, we knew each other. I remember I was in school with him. Mm. Uh, when we were in school together. So that's another uh, thing that's nice. Bill Barman, one of my mentors. Yeah. It was nice coming up coming up here. I would go sit with him in his house. Wow. Just to talk, uh, not necessarily about track and field, but about life. Yeah. And, um, and, and it's just this is the richness of, of, of track and field. Mm -hmm. And um, when I come here, and, I, and when I come here, I feel I feel genuinely accepted. Mm -hmm. And you know, and everybody wants to know that they're appreciated. Yeah. And, and sometimes I'm, I'm moving around, and I, I because when I come to a meet. I'm working, working, working. Mm -hmm. And then some people stop me and start saying, you know what, blah, 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 blah. Oh, I remember this, it's so funny thing. Bro. I was out of the track today and I was talking to uh, Ty Lu yeah. and Cherry. Yeah. Cherry had said, well, where should I move at? And I walked him over to an area and I said, okay. And then we started talking about what he's doing who he has behind him, mm -hmm. uh, where he needs to be positioned when he comes off the turn. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, I got this buzz. <laughs> I'm not, I had to like, oh, let me go sit down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And so those, that mem those memories coming in, that feeling. Oh, yeah, they, they're that still feeling. there. Yeah. Um, my uh, athletic prowess is not there, <laughs> but the memories are. <laughs> uh, you're, lo you're looking young as ever. But then even with the, you know, this new stadium, I, last year at the trials was the first time um, that, you know, they kind of unveiled it. Um, and now they have the world championships this year. How do you feel about, you know, that transition of, you know, old Eugene, old Hayward Field into this new kind of massive stadium where, you know, you're talking about at UCLA, you had 12,000 people come watch you. Most meets don't get that. But, you know, at the world championships here in Oregon, we might be able to get that. How do you feel about you know, that? You're going to get that and yeah. more. And more. I, know, I love it. I mean, uh, it's, um, it's the old saying, uh, you build it, they will come. Yeah. And that's eye candy, like Mount Sac. Yeah. It's another stadium. It's eye candy. We, we're, moder moder we're upgrading and uh, making it come into the new millennium. Mm. And it's nice to see the care of track and field. It has its place mm. uh, amongst um, basketball, yeah. football, baseball. Mm. But see, any of those sports I just named, you have to run in order to achieve the objective. Mm -hmm. Speed kills. Mm. <laughs> Very true. Very true. When you're here in Eugene, when you're in Hayward, so um, either now at Prefontaine, you'll be back, you know, USA's, and then you have World Championships. But what's one thing outside of track? What's one thing you kind of to take yourself away from the track, or maybe a place that you like to go get some food while you're here in Eugene? Um, you know, I haven't. Everything has changed. Mm. Um, we would go to. I know it's one place. Um, the electric station, mm -hmm. right over there across it. That, that's one of my one of my go-to places. Here. Nice, nice. But nice. see, they put so much new stuff around here. It's true. Um, I, I have, matter of fact, those ten days I'm gonna be up here for the world championship. Yeah. I'm gonna sample some of the cuisine <laughs> up here. There you go. So this <laughs> stuff. <laughs> nice. Um, and then. Um, you are, there's so many different coaches at all these different meets who are also very successful athletes um, and have turned into coaches such as yourself. I mean, you have Dennis Mitchell here, you know, like I mentioned, Harvey Glantz, um, Alien Frenzy, um, you know, tons of different coaches. What is a camaraderie like amongst all you coaches, you know, when you do come to these meets and you have athletes competing, so you're kind of going head to head, but um, what's a camaraderie like? You know what? 
I'm, I'm like this. I don't compete with coaches. Mm. I get the athletes that I work with fit enough to compete against the other athletes. And that keeps my ego out of it. Mm. Because if you take what you used to do on the track, and you start coping from that standpoint, yeah. you're missing the whole point of you becoming uh, a master at what you do. Mm. And what happens is you're going to break something. Mm. When you're younger, yeah. of course, it's dead. But as you get older and sustain yourself, the ego can't sustain. Yeah. It'll get tired, get broken, make enemies, yeah. um, get kicked out of the sport, mm. start crossing the line, start doing things you're not supposed to be doing because yeah. the ego's in the way. Very true. But when you take your time, I always tell everybody, you can achieve the ultimate goals that you want to coach or set them in that direction, mm. like, 138 for the 800, 19 flat, mm. 42.5 for uh, 19 flat for the 200, yeah. 42.5 for 400, um, 9, 9.45 for the 100. Mm. And I always tell them, I said, well, that's crazy. I said, there's no different than uh, getting the address and going to a, a function. You have to have the numbers mm. so that you can get your GPS on there mm. and to be able to follow it. I said, I look at it the same way mm. because I am on a journey. Yeah. Well, what if you don't get there? I'm going to get damn close. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> right? There you go. That's powerful. And then actually, very last question, I promise you. Um, what is one thing you're looking forward to? Um, you know, you have your athletes competing at the World Championships now and you kind of have back to back. You have Worlds, you have Worlds, and you have Olympics and Worlds. Um, what's one thing you're looking forward to kind of long term for your athletes and as a coach? Well, one, one my, the athletes are, are the first and foremost. I'm looking to have them improve every year under my tutor. Yeah. So that keeps me focused on right now. Mm -hmm. Because if I start thinking, well, 28 is my goal, but I'm not to 23 yet. Mm, yep. And I've had some people, no, no, no. If you're rolling, the only way that you can go forward yeah. is your, your, your tires have to be, and the wheels have to be on the ground. Yeah. Because if they leave the ground, um, you're at the mercy of something <laughs> that you can't control. <laughs> yeah. So I keep myself grounded. Now. Um, I'm not even worried about 23. There you go. That's good. I'm excited about right now. There you go. I and, love that. And that keeps me grounded. That keeps me focused. Mm. And that keeps me into uh, doing my my best work with the people who I work with. Mm. Yeah, very true. That's powerful. I like that. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Even in the now. Well, Coach John Smith, again, amazing to have the opportunity to speak with you. And yeah, good luck with your athletes. Looking forward to seeing them do some great things this weekend. Oh, thank you. Absolutely.